morning. Thank you for joining me for morning prayer. Um, for this, the, I'll be on the fifth Sunday after Epiphany. Um, these videos will go back to the way that I had been doing them uh, because we are now allowed to have in-person worship. And so uh, we experimented a little bit with trying to record the service live through Zoom through into YouTube, and it, it was a very glitchy process, <laughs> and so it didn't necessarily work the way we were hoping it would. And so we're going to go back to uh, doing it this way, uh, for the time being at least. So thank you for joining me, and uh, I invite you into a moment of silence as we prepare our hearts for worship. We will be using the Book of Alternative Services, and uh, so I invite you to either get your book or to uh, open up a PDF, and I'll make sure the link is underneath this video. Get on page 45 of the Book of Alternative Services. The sacrifice of God is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. Dear friends in Christ, as we prepare to worship Almighty God, let us with penitent and obedient hearts confess our sins that we may obtain forgiveness by his infinite goodness and mercy. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you. Pardon and deliver you from all your sins. Confirm and strengthen you in all goodness and keep you in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. as it was in the beginning, 
is now and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. Page 48. The Lord is our light and our life. O come, let us worship. The Benite, page 49. Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout for joy to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and raise a loud shout to him with songs. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In his hand are the caverns of the earth and the heights of the hills are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands have molded the dry land. Come, let us bow down and bend the knee, and kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, and the sheep of his hand. O oh, that today you would hearken to his voice. The Lord is our light and our life. O oh, come, let us worship. Our reading today is, our Old Testament reading today is from Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 to 13. Isaiah 6, 1 to 13. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin is atoned for. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am, send me. And he said, Go and say to this people, Keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull, and their eyes heavy, and blind their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. Then I said, How long, O Lord? And he said, until cities lie in waste, without inhabitant, and houses without people, and the land is a desolate waste, and the Lord removes people far away, and the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land, and though a tenth remain in it, it will be burned again, like a terebinth or an oak whose stump remains when it is felled, the holy seed is its stump. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our psalm today is Psalm 138. In the book of Alternative Services, this can be found on page 895. Psalm 138. I will give thanks to you, O Lord, with my whole heart. Before the gods, I will sing your praise. I will bow down toward your holy temple and praise your name. 
because of your love and faithfulness. For you have glorified your name and your word above all things. When I called, you answered me. You increased my strength within me. All the kings of the earth will praise you, O Lord, when they have heard the words of your mouth. They will sing of the ways of the Lord, that great is the glory of the Lord. Though the Lord be nigh, sorry, though the Lord be high, he cares for the lowly. He perceives the haughty from afar. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you keep me safe. You stretch forth your hand against the fury of my enemies. Your right hand shall save me. The Lord will make good his purpose for me. O Lord, your love endures forever. Do not abandon the works of your hands. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Our epistle reading is from Paul's letter to the Corinthians, his first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 15, verses 1 to 11. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 11. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the Twelve. Then he appeared to more than five hundred brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach and so you believed. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our gospel reading is from Luke chapter 5, verses 1 to 11. Luke 5, 1 to 11. On one occasion, while the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, and he saw two boats by the lake. But the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. Getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, he asked him to put out a little from the land, and he sat down and taught the people from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing, but at your word I will let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish, and their nets were breaking. They signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me. For I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching men. And when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. This is the gospel of Christ. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ.
please pray with me. Lord, we ask that we would understand your word, and that your word would be planted deep in our hearts and would grow and bear fruit in our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, in the season of Epiphany, we look at manifestations of God. That seems to be the theme that we see in our readings throughout Epiphany. Our reading from Isaiah is very much in this theme. So in our reading, the prophet had a vision of God in the temple. And he sees God sitting on a throne, and his train fills the temple. And he's there with six winged angels who are singing, holy, holy, holy. And the prophet responds, woe is me, I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. So when we are faced with God, God's reality, the holy creator of the universe, a common reaction is to become very aware of our own sinfulness, or even our own smallness, our frailty, our unworthiness to be in God's presence. Um, that's a very common reaction that we get as we read about people encountering God. And Peter has a very similar reaction to Jesus. They're on the shores of the Sea of Galilee. They call it Gennesaret. It's the same thing. And a crowd grows. And Jesus gets in the fishing boat, and he asks them to push out a little bit from the shore. And he does this to create a natural amphitheater. Uh, and people have done this. They, they'll go and they'll sit in the boat, and they'll push off a little from the shore. And the way that the shore is uh, arranged, some parts of the shore kind of have this amphitheater kind of effect where your voice feels like it's amplified and people can hear you a lot better. So as this crowd grows, Jesus steps into the boat and creates this amphitheater so he can speak to a larger crowd. When Jesus was done teaching, he tells Peter to go out to the deeper water and he tells him to let down the nets for a catch. And so Peter is the fisherman. <laughs> But he knows what he's doing. Night is the best time to catch the fish. He had just come in after a long night of fishing. And this trip, they had been out all night, and they didn't catch anything. And, and here we have Jesus the carpenter telling Peter the fisherman. He's directing him on fishing. And Peter has a decision to make. Is he going to take this fishing instruction from this carpenter? He expresses his doubt. We have worked all night long, but have caught nothing. But he also calls Jesus master. And he says, yet if you say so, I will let down the nets. So out of respect for Jesus, Peter follows his direction, but he seems to be doubtful about catching any fish. I'm, I'm happy to, to take your direction, but I'm not thinking we're going to catch anything. But they catch so many fish that their nets begin to break and they have to ask for their partners to come and help them. They fill both boats to the point that both are about to sink. And when Peter sees this, he knows he is experiencing a miracle. And he knows that it happened because of Jesus. So he's encountering Jesus and this miracle is happening in the midst of Jesus and so therefore he is encountering the holy. So he reacts to Jesus in a way that mirrors how Isaiah reacts to God. He, he, we read, he fell down at Jesus' knees, so he's kneeling down in front of him, saying, go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. When we are faced with the divine, a common reaction is to become very aware of our own sinfulness, our frailty, our unworthiness. And we reflect this in the liturgy. As we approach God, we enter a time of confession. We want to come to God, recognizing our need for God's mercy to even approach God. So it's a natural response when confronted with the divine. That experience it invokes and creates humility within us. And humility is necessary when we're dealing with God. It's at this point that Jesus calls Peter into his service to be a fisher of men, one of his apostles. Apostle means one who is sent out on behalf of. 
And this reflects the way that God calls the prophets. That the prophets are those who are sent out to speak on behalf of God. And there's a pattern in the Bible that we often see when prophets first receive their call from God. God calls the prophet, and then the prophet will protest that they should not be the one to do what God is asking. God then reassures them that he will be with them to help them carry out the task. And so famously, we'll see this with, with Moses. When God first calls Moses out, out of the burning bush, Moses responds, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? Exodus 3.11. What if they do not believe me or listen to me? I have never been eloquent. I'm slow of speech and tongue. Please send someone else. This is Exodus 4. It really argues with God. And we see a similar reluctance from the prophet Jeremiah, who responds to God's call, saying, I do not know how to speak. I'm too young. This is Jeremiah 1.6. So in addition to Moses and Jeremiah, we see a similar kind of reluctance in the stories of Gideon, of Saul, who would be king, and Ezekiel as well. Numbers 12.3 says that Moses was a very humble man, more humble than anyone else on the face of the earth. And I don't think it's a coincidence that Moses was considered both extremely humble and one of the greatest prophets to walk the earth. There's something about humility that allows God to work through them in a, particular, in a particularly powerful way. As we read through the Bible, there are certain general principles about God's character that are expressed. And one of these principles is God's desire to work through the humble. In the book of Proverbs, we read, this is 334, God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. What is it about humility that matters so much? Well, one way to answer this is to look at the opposite of humility, which is pride. And pride has been called by uh, the saints of the, in the past, the root of all sin. It is that part of us that turns away from God and rejects God, thinking we can do it better on our own. I can come up with my own ideas that will be better ideas. God's ways, um, I can reject God's ways to do my own, <laughs> make my own way. So pride is feeling more important uh, maybe better than other people. Um, pride causes us to use people to our own ends. It is selfishness. It is pride that causes Adam and Eve to eat the forbidden fruit. It is pride that leads, to, leads us to all other sin. So if you imagine the root of a tree and all the branches, at the root is pride, and all the branches are all the manifestations of human sin. That's the way that the saints saw pride. So in stealing, we think we deserve to have something that someone else has. In murder, we believe we have the right to decide if someone should live or die. It comes down to this kind of selfishness that is pride. All sin has pride as its root. It might be that this dynamic between humility and pride is behind why Jesus chose the disciples that he chose. Why did he choose fishermen? It's not a logical choice. He could have chose Pharisee, the Pharisees and scribes to be, and they're experts in the law. He wouldn't have to spend a lot of time teaching them about the Bible, right? But could it be that fishermen were more open to being taught? Fishermen were under no illusions about being experts in the way of God. Though we know the apostles had their own prideful moments too, as we all do. But there was probably more humility in the fishermen as they received Jesus' teaching than there would be with the Pharisees or the scribes who thought they already had the answers. Jesus would have spent his time trying to continuously convince them that he had to reteach them rather than just teach them. So God calls the prophet, and the prophet seems to be required to have a certain level of humility to be qualified, and then God gives the prophet a mission. So Isaiah is called to speak to the people After he's purified from his sin, we read, Then I heard a voice of the Lord saying, Sorry, then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. And God said, Go and say to this people, 
and then he gives him his mission. So Isaiah's, he's given a mission. And likewise, Jesus calls Peter, do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching people. And when they had brought their boats to the shore, they left everything and followed him. That's what we read. We see a similar story to this in John chapter 21. After the resurrection, Peter decides to go fishing, and a number of the disciples go with him. And so remember at this point, this is after the crucifixion, um, and they witness the resurrection, but Peter had denied Jesus three times, and most of the disciples fled and hid when he was captured. So there might have been a sense that we missed the boat on this, right? Yes, Jesus is the Messiah, but we're no longer worthy to be his disciples, his apostles. We can't rep- How can I represent him when I denied him three times? So they, I, I like the idea that maybe they just decided they were going to go back to being fishermen. So they go back and they, they start fishing. This night they catch nothing, which is like this, uh, the story we have um, from, from Luke here. And then we read that there's a man on the shore who calls out to them, Children, you have no fish, have you? They answered him, No. He said to them, Cast the net into the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast it, and now they're not able to haul it in because there were so many fish. And they recognize at this point that this is Jesus who's yelling to them, and they quickly get on shore. And here Jesus recommissions Peter. He he gives him his mission again. He famously asks him three times if he loves him, which undoes the three denials. And each time Peter responds that he does love him, Jesus gives him a mission. Feed my lambs. Tend my sheep. Feed my sheep. So he, he recommissions him. He gives him his mission again. So if we are to be used by God, then we need to come to God with humility. It's not about our ability. It's about our humility. Psalm 127 says, Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. So often what God is looking for is not well-qualified, well-trained people, but people who are humble and therefore teachable. People who will respond to what God is asking rather than trying to correct God and tell him why what he's asking us to do is wrong. The philosopher Peter Kreeft said it this way, spiritually, our strength is in our receptivity, our active passivity to God, our emptiness. If we come to God with empty hands, he will fill them. If we come to God with full hands, he finds no place to put himself. It is our beggary, our receptivity, that is our hope. I like that idea. So if we think we are unqualified to do what God is asking us to do, then we are in good company with Moses, Jeremiah, Isaiah, Peter, and many others that God has used to do his work throughout the ages. It is the way of God to use the humble to do great things, to use a shepherd boy, who was the smallest of his brothers to be the greatest king of Israel, to take a group of slaves and make them to be his chosen people, to use fishermen and tax collectors to be his apostles, to use a man on a cross to bring salvation to the world. Amen. I invite you to take a few moments to consider what God might be saying to you.
continue on page 52 of the book of alternative services the apostles creed I believe in God the Father Almighty creator of heaven and earth I believe in Jesus Christ his only son our Lord he was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary he suffered under Pontius Pilate was crucified died and was buried he descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. During the intercessions, I'm going to lead spaces for you to silently lift up the concerns you have for your own life, the people in your life, the world, other concerns that are going. There's a lot of craziness going on in the world right now, and so um, I invite you to, to be specific in between these very general intercessions. Let us pray to the Lord, saying, Lord, have mercy. Let us ask the Lord for a day of fulfillment and peace. Lord, have mercy. Let us ask the Lord to teach us to love others as he has loved us. Lord, have mercy. Let us ask the Lord for peace and justice in the world. Lord, have mercy. Let us ask the Lord to strengthen and relieve those who are in need. Lord, have mercy. Let us ask the Lord to renew the church to the power of his life-giving spirit. Lord, have mercy. Merciful Lord, grant to your faithful people pardon and peace, that we may be cleansed from all our sins and serve you with a quiet mind. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, 
who is alive and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. On page 54. Now as our Savior taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into, a te into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Well, thank you for joining me for uh, morning prayer. It's a great being with you. Hopefully, we're reaching the end of this pandemic, and uh, I hope you're all being being safe and that, uh, that this time together has, has blessed you.